It didn't take very long after computers were invented before scientists realized that they could do amazing and useful things by connecting two or more of them together and letting them send messages to each other. That way, they could share their work. Or they could share printers. They could share disk drives and other resources. They've used a lot of different technologies to let computers send messages to each other. Computers send messages on light waves and radio waves and infrared beams and on all kinds of wires fat cables and skinny cables, ribbon cables, telephone cables, and modems with cables. But back in the mid-1970s, a very clever engineer by the name of Bob Metcalf invented the most elegant and popular method of all, and he called it Ethernet. Ethernet has evolved through a lot of different versions, and some of them are very sophisticated now. There are people whose careers are built on making Ethernet go faster, and they study the molecules and the magnetic waves of the cables, but if we summarize it at its simplest original basis, Ethernet is easy to understand, and old-style Ethernet used to look like this. A coaxial cable or wire with little taps on the ends and throughout the middle that could stretch through one or two or three or more computers. Three taps, as you see here, or more. This wire all coiled up neatly, could be stretched out to about 30 feet in length, and it consists of what we would call a three-node Ethernet segment, or an Ethernet segment with three taps on it, one, two, and three, which would allow as many as three different computers to be networked at high speed over a relatively short distance. Ethernet has evolved a lot over the years, and a more modern Ethernet cable looks like this. This one, of course, would accommodate only two connections, or two computers talking to each other. To understand the basics of Ethernet, you need to be introduced to three simple con concepts. First, using a very simple analogy, I will illustrate the way one computer can send one bit of information to another. Secondly, we'll discuss how computers use addressing information to identify each other on a network. And third, We'll discuss the way computers take turns in, in an orderly fashion when transmitting on a network to avoid interfering with each other. For our first analogy, visualize a rope stretched tightly between two springs. Electrical engineers have known for a long time that pulses traveling on wires behave a lot like waves traveling on springs or ropes. So if you can visualize a rope stretched between two springs, as illustrated in this picture, there's really no need for you to worry about the electrons or the magnetic waves or the molecular structure and physics of a cable. We'll leave those details to the engineers, and we'll just talk about the concepts here. If you grasp the rope, as shown in this illustration, you could feel any vibrations that happen to be passing through it. or you could generate some vibrations or pulses of your own by tugging on it, pulling to the left or to the right. If somebody else placed their hand on the other end of the rope, they could feel the motion that you impart to it when you tug it to the left or the right. And the two of you could agree on the way you communicate the most basic bits of information. For example, you might agree that if you tug the rope to the right, you're sending a message that says, one. Whereas, if you tug the rope to the left, you're sending a message that says zero. In both cases, you could just relax the rope and let it return to its center point between bits. Observe that in this diagram, there are only two of you sharing the rope, and we call this a point-to-point -point connection, or a point-to-point -point network. In a point-to-point -point network, the recipient of every message is obvious. When one party on a point-to-point -point network transmits a, me transmits a message, it's obvious that that message must be destined for the other party. So there's no need for the message to contain any address information. But now, suppose that a third person joined the network by placing his hand on the rope as illustrated here. Now, when you send a message, it's no longer obvious which of the other two parties is the intended recipient. To help solve this problem, Network engineers agreed a long time ago to give each connection on a network a name or a number. We refer to this as the station's address, and every station on a network section needs to have a unique address. 
Of course, as computers evolved and as networks grew, it became, it became commonplace to have more than two or three computers on a network segment. Some segments have hundreds. Back in the earliest days of network evolution, designers d agreed that when they're sending a message on a network that has multiple recipients like this, every message would be divided up into sections. And at the beginning of each section, the address of the intended recipient would be transmitted. The system works a lot like an old telegraph. Back in the days of the telegraph, when a message had to be sent, at the very beginning, the telegrapher would, would include Morse code to say something like, message for Salt Lake City from Denver. The beginning of every telegraph message always had that kind of addressing information in it, and it was convenient so that the telegrapher in St. Louis could just go to sleep for a while after he saw that there was a message for Salt Lake from Denver that he could ignore. There are so many similarities between Ethernet messages and telegrams that it's worthwhile examining the way telegrams were put together. First, the telegraph operator would transmit the destination address, some description of the telegraph station that was expected to receive the message. Secondly, the telegraph would send his own location, so people would know from whom the message came, the sending address. Next would come the main body of the message, the sentences and the punctuation and text for which the customer paid a fee to comprise the message. Finally, after the main body of the text, the telegrapher would send some kind of a sign-off message saying, this is Denver, that's the end of the message, signing off for now. Of course, if the main body of the text was just too darn long, the telegraph company might encourage the customer to send two separate telegrams and send it in two separate messages, each of which would follow this same general format. With a simple little diagram like this one, which is read from left to right, just like the sentence on a piece of paper, we can examine the way an Ethernet message is built up. Ethernet messages follow that same general format. A single Ethernet message is often called an Ethernet frame, and if any given Ethernet message is long and complex, or represents a lot of information, or spans a lot of time, that message is divided up into separate, short, individual frames, and each of those little frames follows the same general format. Within each Ethernet frame, the individual pieces are called fields. The first important field within an Ethernet frame is called the destination address. It's just like a telegram. It tells you to whom the message is intended. The second important field in each Ethernet frame is the source address, or a description of the person or station sending the message. Again, just like an old telegram. The third important field is the main body of the text. Once again, it's just like a telegram. Ethernet can handle many different kinds of messages, and an elaborate system of fields and subfields has evolved over the years within this message field. In other segments here at AspenStoWizard.com, we can study the way different kinds of messages can be formatted or encapsulated within the message field. In fact, messages can hold messages inside of messages. But we're going to ignore all of that for right now because we want to keep this little tutorial and this diagram simple. In Ethernet framing, the fourth field, the last field shown in the diagram above, is a little more sophisticated than telegrams. Instead of just saying over or stop or end of message, Ethernet designers found it useful to include some kind of error checking information. So, for example, they'll include a little description of the message just sent. The descriptions are mathematical in nature, but we don't need to do the math. Think of it this way. Suppose you just received a message, and after receiving it, the sender said to you, Okay, there should be 310 characters. Of those 310 characters, 152 should consist of even binary numbers, and 158 should consist of odd binary numbers. And if you add up all the binary numbers, the last four digits should be 0152. If your copy doesn't match this description, let me know, and I'll send it again. Remember our discussion about how an Ethernet segment is like uh, is a lot like a rope stretched between two springs? When only two people place their hands on the rope, we called that a point-to-point -point network. We said that several people could place their hands on the rope and share it. Let's call that a multi-point network. As you can imagine, 
it would be necessary for people participating in a multi-point network to be polite, to share the rope. Because if two people started pulling on the rope at exactly the same time, everybody would be confused. The messages would be garbled and the use of the network would be wasted. To solve this problem, Ethernet designers decided again to borrow some techniques and etiquette from telegraphers. Telegraphers came upon a natural way of sharing the wires stretched in between their various cities by just using normal human behavior. When the wire or circuit was in use, the telegrapher knew it because he could hear the clicking and clacking of the telegraph sounder. In those cases, a polite telegraph operator would simply conclude, okay, I have to wait a little while until the wire goes silent. Accordingly, the first rule of transmitting a message on Ethernet is to take turns in the same orderly fashion. Stations are required to monitor the wire, and if it's busy, they can't transmit. They must wait for a little period of silence between messages before anyone can begin transmitting. Still, even if everybody is well behaved and waits for a polite period of silence on the wire before beginning to send a message, there's always the possibility that two polite, different people might start transmitting at exactly the same time anyway, and they would still interfere with each other. To help solve this problem, the designers of Ethernet decreed that when anybody is transmitting a message on the wire, they must also monitor their own message and make sure they can receive it clearly that it is not garbled. If two or more people do begin transmitting at the same time, as they monitor their own transmission, they will see that it is garbled, and in that case, Everybody is to immediately stop transmitting and wait for a random short period of time before ever attempting again. And this allows an orderly and efficient sharing of the network. In actual practice, it's generally pretty easy for a station that wishes to transmit a message to simply wait for a silent period and then begin a transmission. But once in a while, especially on multi-point networks with a lot of computers, Two or more stations might try to transmit at the same time, in which case they all detect that there's a problem, stop transmitting, and wait a random, short interval of time before any of them try it again. The conflicts are thereby resolved naturally. Well, that's Ethernet. Or at least, that's the basis of the original, old-style Ethernet. Nowadays, there are many different types of Ethernet networks using different kinds of cables running at different speeds, capable of communication over different distances, but they all trace their roots and base their technology on the concepts that have been discussed here. Terminology Now that you are comfortable with these basic concepts, we should cover a little bit of terminology. This will allow you to go shopping for Ethernet equipment, buying things with confidence, and speaking the language written on the boxes in the stores. This will also allow you to understand some of the other training sections and areas that are available here at AskMrWizard.com. Collisions When two or more Ethernet stations transmit at the same time, they garble the message from both, and this condition has been called a collision. Because collisions and collision detections are such an important part of Ethernet operation, Sometimes an Ethernet segment is called a collision network, or a collision domain. Ethernet addresses An Ethernet address is 48 bits in length. That's the source Ethernet address and also the destination Ethernet address. Consisting of 48 binary bits, each Ethernet address is sufficiently precise to allow every single Ethernet interface in every single computer and every single piece of network equipment that has ever been made in the world to have a unique address from among trillions and trillions possible. Ethernet data rates. Old style Ethernet transmitted 10 million bits per second. Later on, more modern versions were built with an accelerated speed of 100 million bits per second. Still later, designers learned how to send billions of bits per second and created what is now called gigabit Ethernet.